Emergency crews rush to the crash site deep in the woods. The injured are taken to hospital in Dryden. I was very concerned because I kept looking at the wing all the time. I thought it was a lot of snow. Well, I didn't notice anything wrong going down the run me. Like I said, it was just when I, we started hitting the trees, I knew there was something wrong. Within 24 hours, a team of investigators from the Canadian Aviation Safety Board arrives at the scene. You're going there hopefully with the idea that you can find out what happened, why it happened, and how do you prevent it from happening in the future. We walked the entire path of the airplane to the threshold of the runway, and then we walked the flight path of the airplane right to the crash site. That was the first thing that I did. I wanted to document what I was seeing by photographing. When you walk in on an accident site like that, there are two things that overwhelm you. The smell of aviation jet fuel and the smell of death. The trees just past the end of runway 29 give investigator David Rohr and his team vital clues about the F-28's failed flight. What happened was the airplane went off the end of the runway in what we would call ground effect and just stayed at that height, simply clipping the tops of the trees. Look at how these treetops have been clipped off. It didn't ever fly. You've got 24 people that died. You've got two pilots that died and a flight attendant that died. And they died, for the most part, trying to do their job. So you really want to do them justice, but you also have to be fair. And uh, if there were mistakes made, mistakes have to be fixed. From the rear of the fuselage, investigators recover the F-28's two black boxes, the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. The devices are designed to withstand temperatures of 1,100 degrees Celsius for up to 30 minutes. Investigators are frustrated to learn that the Mylar tape from the recorders has suffered extreme heat damage. It's estimated the black boxes were scorched by an 1100 degree inferno for at least 90 minutes, far beyond their limit. The data is unrecoverable. That was a big blow to us because now you have to try and gather information and try and establish that it's factual by independent routes. We were just about to leave Thunder Bay and they gave us 10 new passengers. Investigators must now rely heavily on eyewitness reports to reconstruct the events leading up to the doomed takeoff. They learned that the F-28 began its day in Winnipeg and was scheduled to fly a return route to Thunder Bay and back with a stopover in Dryden. But in Thunder Bay, plans changed. The cancellation of another flight forced the crew to pick up 10 additional passengers. And when they did their calculations, they realized that we were overloaded and something had to come off. All right, let's um, offload some fuel then. They ended up removing fuel in order to be within the, the proper weight. Dispatch, Ontario 363. So the flight was delayed an hour. The extra weight of the new passengers left the crew no choice. They had to unload fuel to lighten their load. That meant when they arrived in Dryden, they needed to pump in more than the usual amount of fuel for the final leg back to Winnipeg. Roa wonders if the change in plans somehow led to a miscalculation of the weight and balance. Was the F-28 too heavy for takeoff? He then uncovers a puzzling detail. The plane's weight and balance form for the takeoff from Dryden was never collected as required. It burned in the fire. Roa is forced to use Air Ontario's standard averages to calculate passenger and baggage weights. 
The data, combined with the airport's fuel records, allows him to estimate the plane's gross takeoff weight. We knew how many people we had on board. We knew how many bags we had on the airplane. And we knew what our fuel load was. He estimates the F-28 weighed between 62,000 and 64,000 pounds. And the airplane's max takeoff weight was 65,000 pounds. And so we came to the conclusion that the airplane was not overweight. The cause of the crash remains a mystery. 18 days into the investigation, the Canadian government appoints Justice Virgil Moshansky to lead a more wide-ranging inquiry into all aspects of the aviation system that might have contributed to the Air Ontario tragedy. The government was looking for an experienced trial judge and preferably one who had an aviation background. Moshansky is an experienced pilot with 13 years on the bench. He will work closely with crash investigator David Rohr and aviation consultant Frank Black. The new team's first step, assessing the plane's technical systems. The electrical system, the hydraulic system, the fuel system, all of these systems are looked at both in terms of what is their history leading up to the accident and what remnants are remaining at the crash site that can be examined. Clues to a possible system failure arise when Sonia Hartwig recalls a troubling event aboard the same plane just days before the fatal crash. I think it was Monday or Tuesday. When we took off, there was a smoke that filled the aircraft and there was this horrible smell. I thought, oh my God, we have a fire in the lab. But there was no fire in the lavatory or anywhere else in the cabin. They told us that apparently it had something to do with oil sitting in the APU system. So every takeoff that day, this would happen. The auxiliary power unit is a generator that provides the power needed to start the engines. Did burning oil in the APU somehow cause a fire and ultimately doom Flight 1363? Roa searches the week's journey log for any mention of the auxiliary power unit. He makes a surprising discovery. The APU wasn't working on the day of the crash. It couldn't possibly have caused the fire. But the inoperative power unit may still have played a role in the tragedy. Investigators learned that it forced the crew to make a risky decision in Dryden. Go on to the connectors. Let's hope it holds. Normally, the captain would rely on the APU to restart his engines after shutting them both down for refueling. But if he couldn't use his APU, he couldn't shut his engines down. That meant Flight 1363 had to be refueled with one engine still running. Captain Morwood is in a situation where he's got a hot refuel with passengers on board the aircraft. He's got to keep an engine running to refuel the airplane. Hot refueling isn't against regulations, but the risk of a fuel spill makes it potentially dangerous. In Toronto in 1973, a maintenance person was killed when an Air Canada DC-8 jet was consumed by fire during refueling. Hot refueling is not a normal practice. Could the hot refueling have caused some kind of damage to the engines? The Dryden airport manager, a former military pilot, suspects there was trouble with the plane's engines. He tells Roa he saw the takeoff from his office and heard a sharp, explosive noise just as it disappeared from view. To him, it signified a flameout or engine failure. I thought, this is going to be a high profile and potentially controversial investigation. And the only way to ensure that the truth stands up is to have hard evidence from the aircraft accident. And so we took the airplane completely and we put it in our lab in Ottawa. Anything? With signs pointing to engine failure as the cause of the crash. Strip it down. Roa orders extensive engine testing. Those engines were examined in detail for damage. 
Roa finds the F-28's two Rolls-Royce engines suffered only minor structural damage. There's no evidence of an engine fire, nothing at all to suggest the engines had failed. With little physical evidence to explain the failed takeoff, investigators are back to square one. To solve the mystery, they comb through survivor and eyewitness statements. A common thread emerges. They said in their witness statements, there was snow and ice on the wings when the airplane attempted to take off. Roa studies weather charts for clues. We had very good meteorological information. The charts show that during the half hour the F-28 was on the ground at Dryden Airport, visibility shrank from four kilometers to less than one kilometer because of the snowstorm. And all we may find other reasons. For sure, snow and ice on the wings was a factor in this accident. Sonia Hartwick tells investigators about an unusual sight during takeoff. As we took off, I noticed that the wings just became a solid sheen of gray, shiny ice. Investigators consult the F-28's manuals to study its anti-icing systems. They find that only the wings' leading edges are protected. The aircraft had heated leading edges on the wings. I wonder if the anti-icing system was working. And the heat was provided by bleed air from the compressors on the engine. They found the valves that allow the uh, compressed air access to the leading edges. And they tested the valve to see if it functioned, and it did. The anti-icing system was working. But since it only heats the leading edge, it likely didn't clear ice that formed on the surface of Flight 1363's wings. Investigators suspect that snow and ice buildup, what experts call wing contamination, may have played a major role in the crash. To verify that suspicion, Roa and his team meet with engineers from Fokker. Thanks for coming. Curious to see what you have. Jack Van Hengst, who was the chief engineer, had extensive aerodynamic studies and data on the effects of contamination on an F-28 airplane. Fokker engineers have run simulations of the crash. They were able to get some very good data in terms of the performance of the airplane, simulating the type of loads, temperatures, etc., that the Dryden aircraft would, would have been exposed to. Investigators make a crucial discovery about the design of the F-28. Because of the angle of the wings, a very small amount of ice makes the plane susceptible to stalling. They concluded that even the most minute bit of uh, contamination on the wing would uh, disrupt the airflow and cause a loss of lift. Well, that answers a lot of questions. The simulations support what witnesses saw. It just barely got airborne, dropping wings, losing lift, and then hitting trees, decelerating to the point where it broke up. Investigators are now certain that contaminated wings caused the crash. But what's still unclear is why the plane was not de-iced before takeoff. Almost all airports in cold climates, including Dryden, are equipped with the technology to remove ice from a plane. But Captain Morwood never requested de-icing. It's getting worse. What's the latest? Investigators need to figure out why. They want to understand what made him risk his own life. Let's hope it holds and the lives of the 68 other people on board Flight 1363. Investigators dig through Captain George Morwood's flight records and work history. They interview crew members, searching for clues to his behavior. Captain Morwood was a very, very professional, very old school pilot. He had his view on how things 
should be done properly and what his definition of proper and professional would be. He also was very concerned about his passengers. He enjoyed making sure that they got on their flights on time and got to their destinations on time. You know, Air Ontario was a growing company. It was their first uh, foray into the jet operations. I'm sure that there were many things that Captain Moore would, would have thought in his own mind, this is not how he would do it. And I'm sure at times he probably let uh, the superiors know that. Morewood's history shows he's delayed and canceled flights in the past because of icing concerns. Roa is stumped. Why didn't he request de-icing in Dryden? Another pilot who was at Dryden Airport that day provides part of the answer. He heard Morewood on the phone to Air Ontario. That is what I have been trying to tell you. He was very frustrated and he was really concerned about his passengers. Moore would complain to the off-duty pilot about the company. These guys, you want to guess my weight before I left Thunder Bay? 66 and change. I had to offload fuel. Now that... Right, so now what am I supposed to do? No. You figure it out. When he left the terminal, he was observed by witnesses to appear to be very upset and very angry. Investigators wonder what set Morewood off. They try to piece together the pilot's day on March the 10th. This was the fifth day of a very long week for Captain Morewood. And he was the next day leaving with his family on a ski vacation. Before his first flight of the day, he'd learned the plane's APU still wasn't working. And then, once in Thunder Bay, more bad news. After refueling, the dispatcher forces Morwood to take on 10 extra passengers. Now he must offload fuel and lose more time. There goes the schedule. Let's um, offload some fuel then. This meant Morwood would leave Thunder Bay behind schedule. Dispatch, Ontario 363. And Captain Morwood is the type of captain who didn't want to be late. Now en route to Dryden, and an hour behind schedule, the weather forecast the crew was given of light rain and fog is no longer accurate. And Captain Morwood didn't get the forecast of freezing rain coming into Dryden, which he should have had. As Flight 1363 lands in Dryden, the weather was getting worse by the minute. The plane sat there for half an hour while snow built up on the wings. I gotta talk to somebody about this. Investigators may never know how concerned Morwood was about the weather. But there is evidence that it was on his mind. When Roa questions the fueling agent, he learns that Morwood did ask about de-icing moments before takeoff. Is there de-icing available? The fueling agent says he pointed out the de-icing ground crew to Morwood. The agent then offers a compelling reason that could explain why the captain didn't de-ice. Air Ontario had a policy prohibiting him from de-icing with an engine running. The fluid can be ingested in the engines and then find its way from there to the air conditioning on the airplane and uh, make it extremely noxious in the cabin portion of the airplane. But if Morewood had shut down both engines, he wouldn't have been able to restart his plane. Now, the only other way to start the airplane on the ground is with a ground-based air cart that can provide the compressed air. And uh, Dryden did not have the capability to start the airplane. The equipment would have had to be flown in from Winnipeg. It would have been a costly decision. If he shut it down, he would uh, ground the aircraft there effectively, requiring the billeting of passengers and hotels and at an expense to the airline for which he would be answerable. Right. So now what So he was under a great deal of pressure. No. You figure it out. And I believe that the conversation on the phone would have been about that scenario and his displeasure with it. 
but he didn't have any other chance. It's getting worse. What's the latest? Quite heavy snow. Looks like it's going to be a bad one. It's still within our takeoff limits. Well, that's good. We got a lot of people who want to make their connectors. Let's hope it holds. Though the amount of snow on the wings was still within limits, it's what lay under the snow that doomed the flight. The fuel in a plane's wing can get as cold as minus 40 degrees Celsius. The frigid fuel cools the metal surface of the wing. When snow hits this supercooled surface, it freezes instantly into a barely visible layer of ice. It's a process called cold soaking. And this, of course, is what's disrupting the airflow on the wing and destroying the lifting capabilities. Tell them we're going immediately. Kenora, Ontario, we're taxiing out at this time. Three, six, the only reason that I can possibly think of that led to his decision to execute the takeoff was the fact that he didn't consider the cold soaking phenomena and the fact that those wings could still have ice on them. Advise Kenora, we're ready to proceed. And Kenora driving on terror. Perhaps not wanting to face the consequences of shutting down his engines, Morewood opted to take off for Winnipeg without de-icing his plane. He must have concluded that the ice would blow off on takeoff. That is where he made a mistake, a tragic mistake. But Mashansky concludes that despite his mistake, Captain Morewood is not solely responsible for the crash. It wasn't simply pilot error. There were a myriad of factors which were the cause of the accident. One of the most important factors, Air Ontario's decision to let the plane fly with a broken APU. They were deferring a lot of the maintenance that should have been done because of a shortage of parts. And then they had to scrounge around all across Canada with various F-28 operators to uh, borrow parts from them. And this, this was a, a very bad move on the part of Air Ontario management. The investigation determines that by cutting corners and focusing too much on the bottom line, the airline was putting all their passengers and employees at risk. Because the F-28s were new to Air Ontario, there was this urgency to get one crew off and get the next crew on flying. This urgency to have them in the air producing money. I came to the conclusion after a lot of thought about this accident that there were a lot of other hands on those throttles, pushing those throttles forward. There were a lot of people that were involved in the sequence of events that led to this tragic outcome. This was a preventable accident, but everything conspired against the pilots. I gotta talk to somebody about this. Because Air Ontario management did not have a safety culture and you have to have a safety culture from the top management down. Knowing there are dozens of Fokker F-28s flying around the world, Justice Mashansky takes an unusual step. He releases a report well before his inquiry concludes. Good afternoon. It warns of the plane's vulnerability to ice buildup and stresses the need for frequent de-icing in winter conditions. Even a small amount of icing would be a disastrous on an F-28. But 15 months later, it becomes clear that Mashansky's warnings have not been heard. US Air Flight 405 is preparing to fly from New York to Cleveland on March the 22nd, 1992. The plane is a Fokker F-28, and it's snowing. It's one degree below freezing. At 9 p.m., the jet is being de-iced for a second time since its arrival from Florida. In the past hour, an inch of snow has fallen and shows no signs of stopping. US Air 405, clear to taxi, runway 13. The crew prepares for takeoff. Flight 405 is an hour and 45 minutes behind schedule when Captain Wallace Majeure starts taxiing to runway 13. Then, unexpectedly... US Air 405, turn left and hold short of echo. 
left on the inner to hold short of echo. At 9.07 p.m., flight 405 is forced to wait on the taxiway near runway 13. Another 23 minutes pass. First Officer John Rashuba turns on a light that illuminates his wings. He checks the right wing for ice. He sees none. Looks pretty good to me as far as I can see. US Air 405, runway 13, clear for takeoff. Even though it's now been 35 minutes since their last de-icing, the crew does not request another. Takeoff thrust set. Temps okay. Everything proceeds as it should. Until V1. Rotate. Just after the F-28 begins its rotation. The aircraft had enough flying speed to, to lift off, barely lift off. The wings just could not support the airplane. They knew they were in trouble. 13 seconds after lifting off, Flight 405 crashes on the shore of Flushing Bay. I don't think any pilot really thinks he's going to crash. Uh, they, were, they were trying to save the airplane right to the end. 27 of the 51 people on board are killed. Another Fokker F-28 has crashed with tragic consequences. My reaction when I heard about it was, my God, is Dryden all over again? Within days, investigator in charge Robert Benzen suspects that ice on the wings was the major cause. It would be very, very difficult for either of the pilots to really detect ice on the wings, looking backwards over their shoulders through the, the side windows of the airplane. Looks pretty good to me as far as I can see. So the captain was faced with quite a problem. If he wanted to be de-iced a third time, he would have had to get out of the lines, taxi all the way back into the uh, parking area, and meet up with a de-icing truck again. Take off thrusts. That would have put him uh, very, very late, and it may have even caused the cancellation of the flight. After all of this work, after all of the efforts to see it happen again was extremely frustrating. There were no regulations in place requiring the crew to seek another de-icing after their extended delay. But Justice Mashansky had called attention to the dangers of long wait times when he issued his interim report. If they had followed the recommendations in my Second interim report, this accident certainly could have been averted. He also had drawn attention to the limitations of the de-icing fluid being used at the time. Called type 1 fluid, it's a mixture of antifreeze and water. Those chemicals are designed that as you accelerate down the runway, that they'll actually shed off your wing, so that when you actually want the wing to lift and produce lift, that it's not contaminated. Type 1 fluid is applied hot to de-ice the plane's surfaces. But it doesn't last long. Type 1 fluid had a hold over time in their best conditions uh, of about 15 minutes. Under poor conditions, such as freezing rain, it could be as low as six minutes. During the Air Ontario investigation, Mashansky's team reached a stark conclusion about the effectiveness of Type 1 fluid. Even if Captain Morwood could have de-iced his plane in Dryden... We're fired up, taxiing for departure, requesting airways to Winnipeg. ...it may have made no difference. Hang on a sec, guys. Is there a chance that plane can hold? We're having some bad weather right here. Unbelievable. Flight 1363 had to wait for the troubled Cessna 150 to land. By the time he waited for this 150 aircraft and pilot to land, and then they backtracked and got into position, now they're in a serious snowstorm, and they are getting contaminated. Even if Morwood had de-iced during his 30 minutes on the ground, Rotate. the delay may have been enough for the fluid to stop working. The plane's wings may once again have become coated in ice. It uh, came out in the uh, 
examination of Air Ontario pilots that there was a, a dire need for training uh, in terms of how the de-icing, anti-icing uh, systems worked and how long your aircraft was protected. As soon as uh, our accident occurred up in New York, we of course understood that it was a similar aircraft, in fact a nearly identical aircraft to the Dryden accident airplane. The circumstances were similar in both accidents and uh, the Dryden report was a tour de force which helped us focus our investigation quite a bit. Just as Mashansky had released his interim report more than a year before the crash of Flight 405, his recommendations could have prevented it. Mashansky would soon discover that a breakdown in communication had cost the lives of 27 people in New York. During his inquiry, Justice Mashansky learned that there was another type of de-icing fluid available to the airline industry. It's called Type 2 fluid. It's thicker than Type 1, which prevents it from immediately flowing off an aircraft. A Type 2 fluid is uh, a much more gooey substance. I've heard it referred to as almost mucus-like. With holdover times of up to 45 minutes, it keeps ice from accumulating, then blows off the plane's surfaces at takeoff. Fifteen months before the U.S. air crash, Mashansky recommended greater use of the thicker Type II fluid. Mashansky's investigators also studied de-icing practices at Toronto's Pearson Airport. We got hold of a film crew, and we waited and watched the weather very carefully until we found a forecast of freezing rain. And we tracked one aircraft which was heading for the Caribbean. The investigators discovered an alarming gap in the time between de-icing and takeoff. And from the time the aircraft was de-icing on the gate until the time the aircraft took off was somewhere in the order of 41 minutes. So there was no doubt that aircraft were departing Pearson Airport uh, with a partially or largely contaminated wing surface. We then went to uh, Chicago O'Hare. This was the first airport to actually put in place runway and de-icing pads. And uh, it was very useful in terms of explaining to us how these had evolved, what type of uh, de-icing equipment they were using on them, how they worked. At the time of the US air crash, LaGuardia did not offer de-icing at the runway, only at the gate. Again, 15 months before the crash, Justice Mashansky recommended the placement of de-icing facilities at runways instead of terminal gates. Mashansky also recommended that pilots not only inspect their wings from the cockpit... Looks pretty good to me as far as I can see. ...but also from the cabin. US Air 405, runway 13. Mashansky claims that his report could have prevented the crash at LaGuardia. But the Federal Aviation Administration claims it never received his report in 1990, and therefore couldn't pass the information along to airlines and pilots. But Justice Mashansky doesn't accept that. My second interim report went out in uh, uh, December of 1990. It was about a year and a half before the the Guardia crash occurred. So I, I think uh, probably sat on somebody's desk. The crash of Flight 1363 resulted in dozens of recommendations that could save lives. The crash of Flight 405 ensured those recommendations were widely implemented. Well, there was a lot that came out of Dryden. I mean, uh, the commission came out with 192 recommendations. Uh, it changed uh, the whole nature of how we approach contamination. We now have uh, runway and uh, de-icing uh, pads so they can get a final de-icing before they take off. This was something directly the result of the Dryden Commission inquiry. Today, most airlines use a new type of de-icing fluid, 
type 4 de-icing fluid lasts longer. It will stick to a wing for up to two hours. As well, air traffic controllers must now be able to tell flight crews how long they will be delayed at the runway after being de-iced. Dryden is really the first accident that explored not only what happens in the pointed end of an airplane, but what happens within a corporate culture. It puts CEOs on notice that uh, they can't hide in the woodwork when an accident occurs. Dutch manufacturer Fokker went bankrupt in 1996. Despite this, in 2009, there were still 55 Fokker F-28 jets in operation worldwide, mostly in warmer climates. Nobody should ever lose their life due to a contamination accident again in commercial aviation, anywhere in a snow and ice environment. We've learned all the lessons. 